to my understanding, uh, when Ben Huan and Daniel insisting organizing conference, insisting on have a separating uh, two days for graduate students, part of the reason is actually for the uh, younger scholars and intellectual have their own space and to have more direct, you know, exchange and encounter with each other and potentially actually build up a network quite early on uh, in your life. Uh, so that was the purpose, I think. So these are closing session. Uh, I, I, you know, the four veterans will be speaking in responses to what they observe or what they want to share uh, with everyone sitting here. So the order of things will go this way, and every one of you have 15 minutes, right? And then we'll open up for discussion. Yeah. So without further wasting time, make it. I don't want to. I don't have to introduce anyone here, right? Everyone knows uh, who are these people, huh? Besides that, Megan uh, now moved uh, after some ten, ten some years in Hong Kong, still not completely leaving there, but now spending more time in Sydney, right? So Megan, go first. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Quan Ching. Uh, with 15 minutes each, we're under the same constraints that you've all been dealing with, so I will just cut to the chase. Uh, I've heard a lot of really interesting papers uh, in the last two days. It's, been, it's my task to respond directly uh, to the conference. So I'll start by saying that I heard a lot of really interesting papers. I didn't hear a lot of cultural studies, as I understand it. I heard film studies, I heard queer studies, I heard a lot of sociology and some international studies, but not a lot of cultural studies. Now, from your points of view, that's not a problem in any way, necessarily, uh, because having your own space means you'll be forming relationships and networks that will transform disciplinary definitions in the future. But nevertheless, if professors are good for anything, it's to issue statements about what is cultural studies without um, stammering or getting embarrassed. So I'd just like to say a couple of things about that, in part by returning to some themes that Ben Quat raised in his opening keynote. First of all, to me, what characterises a cultural studies approach? First of all, as we discussed yesterday, it is about deeply being involved with a local situation of your own. This is absolutely not something to apologise for, but it is also about engaging with other people's local, particularly ones you know nothing about and may not even care about. This has been the sort of typifying gesture of inter-Asia cultural studies that you learn about your local preoccupations and investments by engaging with those that people elsewhere have. And a local isn't only geographical, but that gives us a model to think about this. Secondly, cultural studies isn't just studying culture. Just because you look at a, you know, a film or a musical corpus or indeed an anthropological set of practices... That doesn't make it cultural studies. The world doesn't need another discipline to study culture. What cultural studies does is look at the relationship between what is understood as culture and practised as culture in a particular local, the relationship between that and all the things that in that local are considered not cultural, are considered economic or social or political or moral or just bother bothersome. So we look at the role of understandings of culture as well as directly at cultural uh, phenomena and products. Thirdly, cultural studies is the study of contextuality, of how problems, phenomena and practices are different depending on a 
the complex structure of a context in which they occur. And then if you go back to that first definition about engaging with other people's local, you get to know your context by working with others to understand the difference between their context and yours. And Inter-Asia has been formed over the past 20 years around these sorts of things. So I think I would like to hope that more people will take seriously what Ben White said yesterday when he said, don't read. Uh, at least don't read in a way that allows you to fill your PowerPoint with quotations from US-based theorists. I saw an enormous amount of that. Uh, I understand where it comes from, and in the end I want to say what I hope are some helpful things about how to sort of break loose of the dependence on that borrowed authority. Because I think it comes from a context where you have to prove that you've read these things. And there's a difference between a conference and a confirmation seminar or a performance for your supervisor in these terms. But I want to um, give you an example of what it means to think about reading and analysis by developing concepts yourself right now. And you, you can all do that. Uh, I really wanted, after most panels that I heard, to ask each speaker to tell me what concept they wanted to be thinking about. But I thought that would be too terroristic. Um, it, being quite among the examples he gave us was resonance. Uh, I've been reading his early work late, lately. I noticed he started talking about resonance casually uh, in the early 1980s at, at least. I had a moment of resonance yesterday listening to his speech which allowed me to formulate a concept I want to think more about. At the beginning of his speech, he made a strong contrast between the temporality of development in the West and the temporality of largely post-war, post-colonial uh, industrialisation and urbanisation in Asia. And he, he suggested that the historical gap is so great that comparisons are not useful. Um, they, they simply allow Asian developments to be always situated as uh, belated, catching up. So as an Australian, I'm listening to this and I experience a familiar confusion. One is that I have had instilled in me an imagination of myself as Western, obviously, since I was born. The other is a resonance that comes from somebody who grew up perfectly in an ordinary way in post-war rural Australia, in a world without electricity. I grew up without fridges. I grew up having hepatitis like everybody else in my town at the age of eight because the san sanitation was so poor. I first saw a supermarket when I was 20 and I was terrified by the moving belt. I didn't know what to do. I thought it would take my handbag. I've told people this story before. I made my own clothes until I was 18. I mean, in short, I have an experience of rapid development, but it is not part of the imaginary frameworks within which the history of my nation is narrated. And I think a lot of the mental crisis, cultural crisis that a lot of Australians are going through at the moment is to do with the increasing unadaptability of that imaginary status as Western, because it's not that we're not Western, but this other experience doesn't fit that story. So the word that pops into my head is discrepancy. I want to think about discrepant resonance, where there's a resonance, but if I push it too far, it will be stupid. You know, I can't say it to someone who grew up in Singapore Oh, yeah, you know, I had bad sanitation too. <laughs> I mean, that, that isn't the point. The point is the combination of a resonance of experience which is not accounted for in traditional historiography with this discrepancy, which isn't absolute difference by any means. So I can think about who writes about discrepancy. So I'm going to follow that up. 
I am not going to start my next paper with a summary of all the people who've theorised discrepancy. I'm starting with the questions that matter, with the, the knowledges that I have and with what I've heard from other people who speak to me. The, the recently, uh, a Chinese consortium proposed to build an expressway that Sydney cannot afford to build in exchange for the right to place 150 prefabricated Chinese skyscrapers between Central in Sydney and Strathfield. That's a period of... A, they, they want to pull up our entire rail network, put the railway underground and build with an international workforce, which would look just like Singapore's, I'm sure, build 150 skyscrapers. So Australia in that story is actually a place of very slow backward development. And there's a wonderful quote from one of the Chinese developers. The politicians kind of loved it, but were just too terrified to take this on. Uh, one of the developers said, we have moved 400 million people from the country to the city. We're very good at building <laughs> low-cost, high-speed cities. And most interestingly to me, just to finish this example, when I posted this fabulous story on Facebook, most of the white Australian-born Australians were terribly excited by the idea of 150 Chinese skyscrapers. But the people who were completely appalled were Chinese who had lived some time in Australia and hoped to go back there uh, to live in a high-cost, low-speed environment. These are issues... To be followed up, they matter. So, how much time have I got? Three minutes? Yep, okay. So here's some advice about... I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, that's all very well for you. Nobody's going to ask me, Megan Morris, if I've read Saskia Assassin. Actually, I haven't. But I've, <laughs> I've heard it quoted so many times, I don't want to ever read it in my whole life. But this, I can say, here, you can't. But what you can do is what I just performed, what Ben White was recommending. Think from your data and think, yes, you must do your reading, but when you give a conference paper, you don't have to present it. You, you present what you have learned, what you are discovering. And when you go to present your methodology, if you must, don't just say it's mixed or... Uh, I'm using textual and ethnographic methods. These are not methods. These are fields of methods. And one day some nasty professor is going to say, oh, textual analysis, exactly what kind? In-depth interviews? Oh, who was the last person you read who did superficial interviews? <laughs> you know, when you're in a supportive environment, you can just junk that stuff. But talk about method when you have a problem. Method, methodology, discussion of method, is only interesting if you don't know what the method is that will solve your problem. So talk about the problem. That's what actually makes you look smart, <coughs> makes the audience passionately interested, and it will make other people from their local who have a comparable problem come to talk to you. Uh, it's hard to acquire the confidence to do this. And in other disciplines, it's discouraged. I recognise that. But when you come from another discipline to a cultural studies space, we welcome and desire, talk about the things that are not working, the things you can't understand, the things that you don't know yet um, how to solve. If you don't do that, and if you do spend a lot of time trying to make relationships between American-based theorists, wherever they come from, I don't care. They represent the Global English Academy and the publishers who peddle their books around the world. They're excellent books, absolutely worth reading. But if you take your material, you take those books, if you don't do an enormous amount of work to produce relevance, then what you have in the middle is a big, sad gap, you know, and I'll end with an example of, of a fantastic project, to my mind, which worked the opposite way. Audrey Yu, um, my Australian colleague, 
has edited a book uh, called Queer Singapore, Illiberal Citizenship and Mediated Cultures, which has just come out. Now, um, I heard Audrey some years ago give a wonderful paper about pragmatism in Singapore, illiberal pragmatism, but she was asking a question, which is how can it be that this place which still criminalises homosexuality, and this was still a few years ago she's asking this, is starting to produce a confluence of creative industries on the one hand and queer performance and public culture on the other. And how can this be? Now, she didn't start with all the theories that are given about civil society, public culture, whatever. She used them, but by thinking from that practical problem, I, myself, who am not passionately interested in, in queer culture, I don't read a lot about citizenship, but I'm really interested in pragmatism. And as I see this project about Singapore develop, I can see the foundations of a new way of thinking about pragmatic political cultures that has international relevance, because we can all use it. The reason is that it came out of thinking about her data and developing concepts. So I'll pass over to the next.